I had this suggestion that was given to me by actually one of the elders that, well, why don't you talk about humility? I don't know if that was a suggestion to me <laughs> or if he was saying, maybe this would be good for our times. And the more I thought about it and the more I looked at it, the more it is so needed right now. And it really fits with where we are right now because we have so many people who are speaking out, saying things, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of humble attitude about it. And so I think it's important for us to realize that and realize what humility is. And so we wanted to look at Jesus today and the life of Jesus and what Jesus does. And so this is part of the passage in Philippians that we have read about. Jesus is the example for us. He is and it starts with uh, if there is, and it doesn't mean if you ever run into this, but that if there is, because there really ought to be, and so that's the way he's talking about this, there really ought to be this comfort of love that exists among Christians. There really ought to be this participation in the spirit that exists in every church. There really ought to be this affection and this compassion that exists between Christians because they are people who care about each other. They are people who really understand each other. And so he talks about this as kind of a, as he's been talking about his ministry and that sometimes things are difficult and maybe we can translate that to, yeah, some things are difficult uh, just because we're having to deal with a lot of different things. And so, we have lots of restrictions. He says, but it should not change the way we have our relationship with each other. And so, he wants them to know that. He wants them to understand that, this participation in the Spirit, this affection and sympathy with each other. He says, what I want from you is for everyone to think the same way. Boy, that's a big thing. <laughs> everyone to think the same way? He doesn't say everyone to think the same thing because we're not always going to think the same thing. We're not always going to have the same opinion, but we might think the same way as if there's one goal, as if there's one place where we can accomplish, as if there's one thing that we're all intent on becoming or doing. And so we think the same way about that, about what's most important. And what's most important is some of the relationships that we have. And so he says, what I want you to do is I want you to put away selfishness. Don't do anything from selfishness or empty conceit. I want you to think of other people as more important. And so that's a way of thinking, a way of considering other people first. And so he talks about this idea then of being humble and thinking other people are much more significant than we are thinking about their situation, about their issues, about their problems, and being able to look out for the interest of others, he says. And so I think that's an important thing as we realize what he's trying to say. Well, why all this buildup? Why is he talking about this? And I think the reason he's saying all of this is because our work can be destroyed so easily. I mean, it doesn't take much at all for it to suddenly just kind of fall apart and go to nothing. You ever been part of a group where everything is going right? Right here, I know. <laughs> where everything is perfect and it's all the way it should be and there's no difficulty and it just seems so easy and everything's going and then Later on, you find out, well, what happened? It's, it's kind of wobbling a little bit. It's not going quite as well. And I think that's what he's trying to say. It's important for these things. And so he's telling you these things because it gets destroyed so easily that we care about each other, that we all think the same way, that we think other people are more important. And that's what he's trying to describe, that we have the same goal and the same objective. So if you think about the times when things were good and then, well, what happened when they weren't good after that? Well, all the people should have, well, it's not all the people should have, it's 
all of us have to, and it's really including us in all of that, because it is such a fragile thing to see it balanced and see it growing exactly the way it is. Everyone having the attitude and the character of Christ, and it makes everything so much easier, and it makes it all just flow. You can tell when things are going right, and what an amazing thing it is to be able to see that and to understand that. Uh, he continues on talking about Jesus. And so he says, I want you to have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. And so he gives us this example of the mind of Christ and looking at who Jesus is and what Jesus was about. He was willing. He emptied himself. He considered himself nothing. He didn't hold on to the place that he had with God. And certainly he was God. He had this place with God. No, no creation happened without him. And so everything that was made was made because of Jesus and through Jesus. And so he was involved in all of that. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to hold on to that. And so he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death. And he took on the form of a servant, the form of a man, not of God, and eventually the form of a man on a cross. And he says, therefore, God highly exalted. He gave him a name above all other names. What an incredible thing it is to realize that. And we look at this thing about how God highly exalted him. And if we look at our world today, if you mention the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to get one of two reactions. Either people are going to really believe in Jesus and consider that something great and wonderful, or else they're going to hate it. And they're going to think it's just something that, that shouldn't be. And they don't like Jesus at all, but they're going to know the name of Jesus. And they're going to know how important he is. And they're going to know how people respect him. How did God accomplish that? He must have really had a good press agent, didn't he? Where he could send out this message, I want you to know about Jesus. We're all going to learn about Jesus. Wow, what an amazing thing that over... A period of thousands of years, he's still, number one, he's still in the front. You, you would have thought, you know, that ideas come and go. Certainly the idea of Jesus, well, yeah, we used to like him, but not. No, it's always, isn't it? He is in the front. He always is in the front. Therefore, God highly exalted him, and God still highly exalts him. He, it's how he keeps his place that God could have done this. But it's what he did because of what Jesus had done, because he humbled himself first and took that place as a man on a cross. I think what happens with us is we want to be exalted first. I don't mind being humble as long as you think I'm great first. And if you think I'm great first, well, then, okay, yeah, I can be humble now. I'll go ahead and be humble because you already know I'm great. But if you don't know I'm great, then who's going to tell you? You know, somebody's got to, once again, we need a press agent, don't we, to ev let everybody know how great we are. And then when they know how great we are, well, then we can be humble. You know, even if it's a little bit fake humble, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm just really wonderful. You know how that is that people are able to, and I think that's more our approach. We would, we would be humble. We don't mind being humble. It's just we want everybody to know just how humble we are. We're kind of proud of our humility, after all. And yeah, I know, that just goes in a circle, doesn't it? And it gets worse and worse. I think what's happened sometimes is as we face Christ, and we look at who He is, and we see the words of Christ and all the characteristics of Christ, and we look in ourselves and see the characteristics in ourselves, they don't match. Because Jesus really was humble. He really did put others first. 
He really did look out for them first. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we adapt his ideas. But you see, there's that part in red that still talks about our anger and about our selfishness. And yeah, it's going away. But in order for us to get to the attitude of Jesus where we can really be humble before God, he says that's one of the things that's most important. And God glorifies because someone humbles themselves, because we would confess Jesus as Lord. And it is to the glory of the Father the reason that we would confess Jesus as Lord. And you see the response from the passage, the response, our response would be that every knee would bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. That every tongue would confess Jesus is Lord. Do we see that? Well, they all know the name Jesus. And maybe at different times they have to be able to understand and be able to confess this. As we talk about salvation, sometimes we talk about repentance and confession and baptism. This is one of the passages where he talks about confession, that every person would confess Jesus is Lord. Not just the fact that they're confessing Jesus is Lord in an abstract way, but they would confess Jesus is Lord, I mean my Lord, and that that's what this is about that they would bow before him and they would confess so that God could be glorified in all of this. That's what Jesus has done in his humility. So this is about Jesus being humbled. Or is this about Jesus being exalted? Well, yes, it is, both. And it takes the humbling first, so that God can exalt later. It's one of those things that we see. We play a part in how much people will bow and confess because they're able to see the life of Jesus in us and the way Jesus is in us. So how did Jesus humble himself? What really did that mean? We see the big picture. He was you know, up in heaven, leaving heaven, coming to earth. What I want you to realize is that's a long way down. Okay? Let me read a passage for you that says, here's perhaps where he started. Revelation chapter 4, you see the description of the throne room where Jesus sat at the right hand of God. John writes, After this I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne stood in heaven. There one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance as an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. These are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And the first living creature like a lion, and the second living creature like an ox, and the third living creature like the with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like a eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each one of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He who was and is to come. 
And Jesus came down to us from the throne. From the 24 elders, down from the cherubim, down from the heavenly hosts, down from the sea of glass, down through the gates of heaven, down to earth, down to being human, down to being a human baby, down to being a human baby for poor people. And then he grew to be a respected teacher and miracle worker with all the limitations it has here. And then he was ridiculed by the Pharisees and scribes. And it went down to being hated by the leaders of the people and down to be rejected by the very people he did miracles on and by the people he tried to teach. And many walked away at his teaching because they just couldn't get it. They just couldn't understand and they didn't believe in his miracles and so he couldn't heal them as they sat in their misery. Down to the garden where they fall asleep when he prays for his life down to the betrayer, a kiss. And Jesus is sold for 30 pieces of silver, down to soldiers, down to a trial, one that was a mockery, down to an angry mob, down to carrying his own cross. And he can't even do that. Down to nails, down to being crucified, between thieves, stripped as they gambled for his clothes, down to a sponge and then a spear in his side, down to a grave and to a stone rolled over the entrance, down to guards posted, down for three days. And then God highly exalted. And up from the grave he arose. Was he ever humble again? Yes, always. How could you be humble after God had exalted you? But don't you understand? It's the reason why God has exalted you is because you're humble, don't lose it now. And so keep that humility, keep that humbleness that Jesus has. And we see humble is the reason God exalts. And if we are humble, we can be exalted. If we're not, we're lifting ourselves up and we'll go just about as high as we can push ourselves, but you won't get God to exalt. Peter writes about this condition in 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse 21, he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. What a tremendous thing he does as he describes Jesus Christ suffered, leaving us an example to follow in his steps, to follow in the way that Jesus did. And then he describes what it means, what these steps are, what it would be as these steps are. First is he committed no sin. Well, we struggle with that one, right? He committed no sin he was also absolutely honest. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Always told the truth. Always acted the truth. Always was the truth. Didn't allow the, oh, I'll just let him assume something and not correct it. No, he let them know everything, didn't he? No deceit 
found. And when they reviled and said bad things about him, he did not revile in return. It's hard to do that when someone is shouting at you. It's hard to maintain your composure when there's this screaming anger. Have you ever had that? When somebody is so angry at you, the only thing they can do is scream, and you almost can't make out the words that they're saying, but you can feel the spit as it flies at you. You ever had that? It's really hard to not say something back and try to maintain your composure. I hope you haven't, but... Yeah, Jesus was there as they screamed, crucify him, crucify him. They want blood from somebody, and it is from Jesus. But after all, Jesus suffered but did not threaten because he had somebody there to defend him, right? He had Peter with a sword. But no, Peter gets an ear, and Jesus heals the ear And tells Peter, I've got 12 legions of angels on standby. (laughs) I've got 72,000 angels on standby. And one of them could take care of all of Jerusalem and Judea. He was not powerless. Please do not think of humility as powerless but he did not use his power for himself. He did not act scared because he wasn't powerless. He just chooses not to use it then. And then number five, perhaps the most telling, he continued entrusting himself to God. That's one of the hardest ones, isn't it? committed no sin, no deceit, reviled, and he did not return it, suffered, but did not threaten, continued entrusting himself to God because God has a better plan than we do. And God will figure out a better way than we can. He doesn't tell you everything. And so you just have to trust that his plan is going to be better, that it will work out better. Just know God has got this. And we're just going to go along with it. And he bore our sins in his body on the tree, and he accomplished something by his humbling. Because by his sins, we are healed. By his wounds, we find forgiveness and healing. We think of healing from sickness, but he says, what about healing from sin? Maybe we need to recognize that. It's because when a person is healed from disease, they don't have it anymore, and it doesn't go anywhere, and they don't have to worry about it anymore. And yet, when we find ourselves forgiven of sin, we seem to assume it's going to come back right away, and we'll struggle with it, and we'll still have it, and we'll still have to do it again, and then we'll need forgiveness again. And then, what if you were healed from sin so it never came back anymore by His wounds? We are healed. And we walk in his steps. Just like Jesus. He came as teacher and Lord. He came with miracles and with the word of God. He came with a very good understanding of scripture and what it means. He came to live here, but he was not weak in his humility. He had argue. He could. He had power, and he could argue. I, I love to read some of the arguments because it's just so staggering the way he's able to do that. And he knew how to respond to the Pharisees, and he knew how to call them out, and he knew how to re, how to deal with them. He doesn't go after them or attack them. And yet Jesus, in all of his humility, was there to defend disciples and to defend against other people who would criticize him. But he spoke, and he was heard, and he won the argument, and he always had people wondering how he could do that. And there is no lack of self-esteem with Jesus. He, he doesn't walk around with bowed head unless it's bowed before God in prayer. And he can clear a temple if he needs to. He just doesn't need to very often. 
and he's humble. He does stand up for God. He does stand up for the lowly. He considers and he heals the sick and those with disease and those with demons. He came as a really powerful, humble person. And that is the steps you walk in. Is that kind of power in humility. He didn't even turn stones to bread when he was starving. And he cared for others and he fed them and he taught them. And I think maybe our biggest issue with willing is with humility is our willingness. I think that makes the biggest difference of all. And that's the, one of the things that we struggle with the most. What are you willing to do for Jesus? Well, can't we pay somebody for that? That's become the new standard, isn't it? Don't we pay somebody for that? You know, that's how it works, right? You would treat others more important than yourself. Humble is about being willing, about being obedient to what God wants, about willing to do whatever, willing to leave heaven, willing to go to a cross, willing to be abused, willing to die in order to be raised. But I think that's our biggest issue is being willing because we say, well, I think somebody else could do that. And we may not be willing to be humble especially humble to God, humble to follow His Word, because God speaks. He's not silent. His Word is there, and His Word speaks. And sometimes it's we're not even willing to be submissive in a relationship, willing to be submissive to a spouse, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, not submit to one another because you ought to, you're supposed to, it'll go better. No, this is about your relationship with Jesus that will make your marriage better. And that's both for men and women. He doesn't say women, he doesn't say men. He'll talk about women a little bit more. But he says, I want you to be able to submit to one another. Whether you're married, it doesn't have to be married. Just to everybody to the people you would work with, to the people in church, to the people everywhere, that we would be willing to be submissive to elders, willing to be submissive enough to worship, willing to be submissive enough to learn and to listen when God speaks, to be submissive enough to be baptized when we need it. Yeah, we argue with that one, don't we? Well, I don't think I have to have that. Well, to be submissive enough to repent when we need that. So, how would we go down? We've talked about Jesus and about where he came from and about how he was submissive and about how we went down, he went down. And I think that's what I wanted you to see from this. But how would we go down? Well, we don't start quite as high, do we? Not quite as lofty a place. In fact, we start pretty low. How much lower can we get? Because we're in high society. Well, no, we're not. We're in middle class. <laughs> and some of us aren't even in the middle class. And so when you started lower than the middle class, how do you go down from there? Well, we give up ourself. We give up our own pride. And whatever we would be proud about, we give up some time on Sunday morning. Because you're here. And you came because of Jesus. And you're submissive to him as you come to worship him. And so that's part of it as well, that we would be here to worship or would be at home to worship, but we would take that time to where we're not having breakfast in the middle of the thing going, oh yeah, 
turn it down. I'm, yeah. That we would give up some time to teach our children their importance. And we need to be submissive for them to help them learn about Jesus, that we would be willing to be submissive with our money and say, I want to be able to work for God around the world as Mission Sunday approaches, that we would be willing to share some good words with people and to be submissive enough to tell them how great they are and not just waiting for somebody to tell us but that we would encourage them and lift them up and build them up and work together with them and trust them, and we will be exalted. I don't know where you have to go in your life, where it is that you need to do to be humbled. Did we leave room for God to exalt us, or, you know, have we pretty much already done that ourselves and let everybody know how great and wonderful we are You know, God does a much better job. So what does humble mean in your situation? You may think you're lowly already. How do I get exalted? I don't care how low you are now. You humble yourself to be exalted. You see other people above yourself. And you give God your submission and your obedience. And so where where do you need to go down? It is so telling that the most powerful person that ever lived was also the most humble. And so what do you need to do? If you want to be baptized, we have water. If you need someone to pray, we would love to do that with you as we humble ourselves to pray for you.